smaller and medium-sized companies are only in the process and catching up with this. And they need still better strategies to also not only recruiting international people, but then also when they enter the workplace that they have the right environment to succeed there. And I think that is one of the biggest challenges that's currently happening there in the German labor market. Hello and welcome to Inside Deutschland, your guide to careers in Germany. This podcast provides you with insight into working in Germany and covers topics such as the do's and don'ts for job interviews, pitfalls to avoid in communicating with employers and colleagues, and how to navigate opportunities and challenges across the German labor market. I am your host, Jessica Schuler, a Germany-focused career coach, trainer, and international educator. As part of the Inside Deutschland podcast, I will be interviewing people from all over the world who have been successful in Germany so that you can learn from their experiences and expertise. In our last episode of this first season, we want to look towards the future of the German labor market, or Arbeitsmarkt in German, by asking how is the German labor market developing and which jobs will be in demand in the future? To answer these questions, we invited two guests. One of them is Teresa Freitas Monteiro, a DAD alumna who recently handed in her doctoral dissertation at the Humboldt University in Berlin and is now starting her postdoc in economics at the University of Copenhagen. But before we hear more about her story, which includes having lived in 11 countries, we're going to jump into the interview with Florian Kunze, who we just heard from. <laughs> Professor Dr. Florian Kunze has held the Chair of Organizational Behavior at the Department of Politics and Management at the University of Konstanz since July 2014. He's the Director of the Future of Work Lab in Konstanz as well. His research focuses on the digitization of the workplace, especially home office and mobile work, managing demographic change, and diversity in public and private organizations, as well as designing effective leadership. Hello, Dr. Kunze, and welcome to the show. Hello. Thanks for the invitation. Thanks for having me. Absolutely. You lead the Future of Work Lab at the University of Konstanz. Can you start by telling us a little bit about yourself and what you do in the lab? Yes, sure. So, yeah, I'm, as you said, head of the Future of Work Lab at the University of Konstanz and also holder of a chair for organization behavior which means I'm looking at work-related issues from an organizational psychology perspective. So I always say I'm interested in all social and psychological interaction that happen at the workplace, be it in teams and whole organization, how does leadership function, what is good and bad HR management practices. In particular, also related to that future work lab, I'm looking at the, from my perspective, from our perspective, me and my team, at the University of Konstanz, most interesting future topic in the workplace, which we define via the big three Ds, which are digitalization of the workplace, um, increasing diversity of employees at the workplace, and also the demographic change and how that affects workplaces in Europe, but also in other European or worldwide countries. I need to ask a question here just to interject real quick. That's not the project about the integrating at work for apprentices, right? That is also integrated, for example, in the diversity topic. So diversity also refers to gender diversity in the workplace, but also to migrant and ethnic diversity in the workplace. And there, there is a specific topic that you might want to refer to, which is um, how do the increasing number of migrants which enter the German workplace get integrated? And if you like, I can tell you a bit more about that project and the most recent finding that we have in there. Yeah, that would be great if you could tell us a little bit more about that. Yeah, so what we do there and, and the ambition is, uh, it is a highly ambitious project. So we try to follow up more than 1,000 apprentices. So also for our international listeners, so the most uh, common way of entering the workplace in Germany is if you're not studying at the university, is doing an apprenticeship or a traineeship. And we try to get an idea of what happens if native, but even more interesting, migrant apprentices entering the workplace in Germany. And we have designed a study in which we follow apprentices from the day one of their work experience over their three-year apprenticeship. So what we have done, we have designed a smartphone app for that study with which we send surveys constantly out to these apprentices and want to get an idea what happens 
as said, from day one in their apprenticeship. So how do they get treated from their employer, from their colleagues, from their supervisors? What kind of experience do they have? And then we can see later on um, in how far that relates to the most important outcome, meaning completing successfully or in the worst case, quitting the apprenticeship. Because what we see nowadays in the German workforce and German companies that the quitting rate of international migrant apprentices is much higher than those of natives. And our interest here is to get a better idea why that is the case and then in a follow-up to also help apprentices and also companies to do better here, so to lower these quit rates of migrant apprentices. And that project is running then 2019, so we've started that in 2019. So um, first wave of data is already in, so even though that's still ongoing, and we have already some ideas and um, some results what might play a role here. And um, most importantly, and that is also potentially interestingly and not so surprising, uh, language plays a certain role here. So language capabilities, language skills, German language skills are one of the most relevant predictors of successfully completing such an apprenticeship and later then also integrating. Also, education plays a role here that is also kind of to be expected. Higher levels of education help you to also succeed here in these apprenticeships. However, and that is also then core of that project, we also find that the concrete interaction and experiences that you make in the workplace, so how you are treated by your co-workers and supervisors, play a really, really crucial role of further completion of the apprenticeships. And that matters from day one of the apprenticeship. So we constantly ask, as said, this apprenticeship of the work experience. And if they report negative work experience, so feel not so well treated, there's a much higher likelihood later on that they quit the apprenticeship. And that is important, I think, first also for migrant apprentices who enter the workplace to really pick also the best employer and get an idea also why the recruiting process already, how they feel treated there and that they feel also welcome there. And on the other hand, also for the employers, that it really makes it different how they treat their, especially migrant apprentices from the beginning on in their day-to-day -day social interaction. So you just talked a little bit about the research project itself, as well as some of the challenges that you're seeing in the kind of early results or what's the indicators of that are. Um, I'm curious from your perspective, if you think that, you know, bringing in internationals or helping internationals um, integrate into the workforce is a reliable strategy when it comes to fulfilling um, labor market shortages in Germany. Yeah, I mean, it's definitely a reliable strategy and it's always a must because uh, what we are currently facing and it's really now happening in Germany, it was always a projection over almost decades that there will be a, a worker shortage in, in Germany and that is now really the reality. Though there is uh, almost a must to increase labor market participation, especially of migrant and international employees in Germany. We see that both for lower skilled task uh, in companies, there's a need for that, but especially also for middle and higher skilled tasks in companies, there's a big need and there's a current shortage and there's a really, really big need to recruit these people to get them to Germany, but then also later on, and that is our ambition here, to also create the environment that they can succeed in Germany. Because what is happening in many companies and especially in small and medium-sized companies, which are also now confronted with this issue and need to recruit also internationally, they are currently not so well prepared for this. We have like big companies who are already internationally integrated, who have a big HR department, who have onboarding programs, who have also years of experience with international employees. But these smaller and medium-sized companies are only in the process and catching up with this. And they need better strategies to also not only recruiting international people, but then also when they enter the workplace, to, that they have the right environment to succeed there. And I think that is one of the biggest challenges that is currently happening there in the German labor market. Well, and it's especially the case if you think about from the applicant perspective, if maybe the German skills aren't as high as they could be, and then you also have maybe a environment that isn't as well developed for integrating international employees, you're going to have kind of a, a tension touch point, right, between the two parties that are involved there. What types of strategies have you seen companies um, doing to, to integrate their international employees or migrant employees? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so, I mean, having... Preparation programs, I mean, as said, like bigger companies already do this, like increasing their language skills, also familiarizing them with the German work culture is helpful. So to have like kind of specific tailored onboarding programs, socialization programs, 
where they get into the first weeks when starting the new job, be it an apprenticeship or like a regular job, that they get kind of an overview. What are the do's and don'ts in the German work culture? That they know there are also the specific terms in their specific job that they can trade there. And we also see in our results and our studies that I just mentioned, companies who invest in these socialization programs and these onboarding programs, also their migrant employees, migrant apprentices are doing much better. Excellent. Thank you for that. I'd like to transition to talk a little bit about the current and future of the German labor market. So the German labor market was in great shape in 2019 by many measures. Uh, as we all know, there were massive layoffs in 2020 with the pandemic, and we recently entered into a recession. What has changed in the meantime, and what would you say is the current state of the labor market? Yeah, so from my perspective, there are different transformation, transformational trends happening simultaneously. So one is uh, obviously these, we already talked about that shortage of talent, which is now really obvious and really pressing for many companies. So they're really, it's really a business case nowadays. So really even like smaller companies talking, for example, about bakery chains, they cannot keep all their subsidiaries open because they don't have enough personnel um, available. On the other hand, we have transformation processes also in many like the, the big industries in Germany, mostly, for example, in the automotive industry, where we see a big, big transformation process. I'm also involved there in a consultancy role in, in, in some companies who were super successful. And most of our listeners might be aware of that, like the big names of German automotive companies. They are worldwide renewable and, and successful. But now they have a hard time to transform to uh, new ways of business in the um, electric automotive industry. So they need to reskill their personnel. So that is something is happening. At the same time, there's also digitalization happening massively in the automotive sector and also in other sectors. And there's a need for new talent and reskilling of existing talent in that, in that direction. And uh, furthermore, other trends, which I also did recently research on, is also like the, the trend to more flexible work environments, which is also happening in Germany. S uh, talking about like more remote work option, working remotely from home, that was really the exception before the pandemic in Germany. And now it's totally changing and... Uh, also here, in light of the scale of talent, companies need to adapt here. So a lot of different trends and transformation trends happening simultaneously in Germany. And um, looking at that from an external perspective, which is probably most interesting here from an international perspective, there's big opportunity to enter the German labor market because almost in all areas, different industry, but also different educational background, there is a need for talent in the German la labor market right now. Going off of that, where do you see the work week going in the future? Do you think we're going to be moving more towards a four-day work week or kind of more of a part-time setup instead of a full-time setup? Where do you see that going mm -hmm. in Germany? Yeah, there's also an accelerating uh, discussion now in Germany about the reduction of the work week from five days to four days. So some labor uni union, the biggest labor union in Germany, the IG Metall, the big industry labor union, try already to uh, negotiate for that for their for their members in the next round. So there is an accelerating discussion about that. And um, the question is, uh, will that really happen on a big scale? So we already see that in a few companies, exceptional front runner companies who are already experimenting with that, but of course not a general phenomenon nowadays. Um, over the last decades, uh, we obviously saw reduction of working hours in many industries already in Germany. So we have in an OECD comparison almost the lowest working hours worldwide, if you compare it. Uh, the question is now, can we sustain our um, competitiveness worldwide if we further reduce it now to a four-day work week for almost everybody? I would be a bit skeptical here. I think there, there will be more transition in that direction, but with big flexibilities. I mean, some people might say, okay, I accept that now, um, but I also accept then lower salaries. Um, but having a four-day work week with a similar salary as nowadays, I think that is not happening too quickly. And then also kind of along the lines of outlook and the future of the German labor market, we've been hearing a lot le recently about the greening of certain industries and certain jobs. Could you tell us a little bit about what that means and how much impact you think that's going to have on the workforce and the labor market in the future? 
Mm -hmm. Yeah, so we have started this already in the last decade, but now with higher efforts and more ambition also from the political sides to do a transformation in terms of a green economy, in terms especially of the energy resources that we want to rely on. And um, even though not being the biggest expert on this, I would say there is a big need for expertise in that field. Uh, if you have any expertise in these new energies, transformation of energy policies, I think there are many companies which are in big need of really experts here. But we also see that in other sectors, as we already talked about, for example, the automotive sector, which is now in a transformation process to more sustainable electric mobilization policies. And also there, there is a big need for people who have expertise in this. And uh, we try to be one of the internationally also forerunner in all of these areas. And if you want to bring in your expertise and your ambition in that areas, I think that is more than welcome if you come to Germany and help us here to also be successful in this really challenging uh, transformational process. Absolutely. Are there any other professions that you think will be especially in demand over the next five to 10 years? Anything that sticks out to you? Yeah, I mean, people uh, with skills in uh, these key um, artificial intelligence, digitalization, knowledge, uh, programming skills, I mean, as in many other economies, that is one of the key future skills that we need. So there's really a big need also for this in many areas, be it in the bureaucratic sector even, but also in many private sector companies, there's a big need for these uh, people with good to really good IT skills, which are needed. Excellent. Dr. Kunze, thank you so much for being on the show today and for sharing your thoughts with us about the future of work in Germany. Yeah, thanks for having me. It was a pleasure. Considering the context of current labor market shortages, there's a big need in Germany to recruit people from all over the world, especially to the IT sector. Our next guest can tell us from her very own personal experience how she experienced the changing German labor market in the past few years. But it's not only her personal point of view that she's going to be sharing. Instead, Teresa Freitas Montiero also researches how changes in the social political conditions of home countries affect migrants' integration into the German labor market. Teresa is a DAD alumna from Portugal. She came to Germany in 2018 and finished her PhD at the Humboldt University in Berlin this year. She also worked at the Institute for Employment Research, or in German, the Institut für Arbeitsmarkt und Berufsforschung, IAB, from the German Federal Employment Agency, referred to as the Bundesagentur für Arbeit in German, as a doctoral researcher where she got a scholarship. Hello, Teresa, and welcome to the show. Thank you, Jessica. I'm very happy to be here. You worked at the Institute for Employment Research, or in German, it's the Institut für Arbeitsmarkt und Berufsforschung, the IAB. Um, this is also under kind of the umbrella of the German Federal Employment Agency or the Bundesagentur für Arbeit. Can you tell us a bit about what the IAB does in general? So basically, the IAB, it's really a research institute. People there mostly do sort of like data management, data production. They run surveys, do policy reports and academic research. And the IAB is linked to the BIAS, to the employment agency, basically because by law, the BIAS is obliged to do labor market and occupational research, mostly to evaluate the effectiveness of some of the measures that they do. And basically, this is what the IAB is for, is to support the BIAS and to do this background research. And of course, that with time, the IAB then has developed other specializations, but still most of the research we do is somehow connected to the labor market. In my case, maybe I did more related to migrants, but it's still the labor market integration of migrants. And I think that's really a huge advantage of the IABE is that as being an employee there, you have access to the administrative data of the employment agency. Uh, and this really gives us a hedge in policy advice and academic research. And I think this is in reality, if you think like what is the overarching goal of the IAB, and it's basically to produce high quality research uh, and produce comprehensive and secure data that basically helps us to provide sound ad policy advice in the area mostly related to the labor market. Um, and even though there is sort of this link with the BA, the IAB is, scientific, is a scientifically independent institute. So we are not really involved on anything of the day-to-day -day management of who gets benefits or so on. We just evaluate things. And very importantly, <laughs> sorry, you can be at the IAB without speaking German, which we couldn't do if you were at the BA. <laughs> yes. <laughs> oh, interesting. 
And your research specifically focuses on integration of migrants and refugees in Germany from a microeconomics perspective. Can you tell us a bit about your research? Uh, sure. So, I mean, one of the studies that I did together with Jacopo Bassetto, basically what we do is that we look at how changes in the social political conditions in the home countries affect migrants' intentions to stay in Germany and their labor market outcomes. So, as you can say, is that most migrants, myself included, we arrive to a host country uh, with the initial idea of how long do we actually plan to stay. So maybe you think, oh, I'm just coming for one or two years. However, as we stay... There are changes in our personal circumstances. There are changes in the conditions of our home countries. There are changes in the conditions in Germany. And basically, the changes in these conditions will make us revise our intention to stay in Germany, right? And revisions to this intention to stay will have an impact on our labor market behavior. So it influences my incentives to learn German. Maybe it will change my incentives now. I will maybe want a job that is more stable in Germany. I want to have a larger career prospect, right? So really this, how your intentions to stay change, we really affect your labor market behavior. And basically, we are very interested in this question. So I think like also has some practical examples. You know, when you see a migrant that has lived in Germany for eight years and still doesn't speak any German, you know, many times this person arrived and thought, oh, I'm just going to stay for one or two years, so it's not worth to learn German. And then as time passes by, <laughs> this person keeps updating because there are things changing. And then, you know, like eight years has spent and just still doesn't know German, right? And I think, for example, we also see this phenomenon in the, in the recent wave of Ukrainian refugees that's basically migrated to Germany after the Russian invasion in 2022. And many Ukrainians arrived in Germany thinking they were just going to stay for a short period of time. However, has this the intensity of the conflict in Ukraine increased and there were more cities being attacked, many Ukrainians revised their perception of security back home and basically delayed their intentions to return to Ukraine. And once they started to have this longer-term plan in Germany, they started to get more incentives to learn the language um, and to start the bureaucratic process of recognizing their qualifications. And so basically this is, we don't explore the Ukrainian case, we basically take a very broad perspective, but basically what we are interested in is to provide causal evidence that negative social political shocks in the home country, such for example as terrorist events, do uh, impact the intentions to stay in Germany and that this impact on intentions to stay is going to affect our labor market behavior. Wow, those are fascinating topics. I'm I'm like nodding and like very, very interested in this. It's also great because it's very connected to to larger trends. Like I can see some of the connections there, but I'm wondering, you know, as a researcher on the topic of migration and employment, as well as, you know, kind of being an international in Germany yourself, where do you see connections between the research that you're doing and what's kind of happening on the ground in Germany on a broader scale? I mean, I think Germany has many European countries is facing issues related to an aging population. So you do aging population and uh, labor shortages, particularly of very highly skilled workers. So basically, Germany needs migrants and needs migrants to come. And for this, there has been some changes in the law that have eased, but it's still not very easy for, for example, for qualified migrants to get that are from outside of the EU to get their qualifications recognized. Um, for other migrants, it's maybe more difficult to get a visa to come to Germany if they don't have a certain income or if they don't speak German. And I think that Germany is working towards this, but there is probably still more to do because um it really needs more migrants to basically sustain also its welfare state and its uh, economic production. And I think that another thing I saw a bit more, uh, <laughs> I would say, anecdotally, but I mean, one thing that one challenge in the German faces is the transition to low carbon sources without having companies cutting output. And this requires significant investment in building power generation and transmission infrastructure. And the problem, which is again what I also experience, is that Germany is very bureaucratic and has a lot of red tape, and this makes some of this process very slow. And you also see this causing delays in public construction projects and in the digitalization uh, of both the public and the private sector. And all these things are kind of vital for economic growth. 
And uh, I mean, it's a very long discussion, uh, <laughs> but I think that as a migrant and uh, living in a digitalized country, I think it makes a huge difference because when you want to use either public or private sector, you can access them online, just press a button and you switch to English and off you go. And in Germany, this was not possible. So I think a lot of things are really difficult in the, in the public you want to take care of just some legal things and it's difficult because there is nothing available uh, in English. So some of these challenges that you see in research, you're also experiencing in your daily life in Germany too. <laughs> yeah, I mean, Germany has a lot of the benches. And I remember when I arrived, I was amazed with the trains because, you know, coming from Portugal, we have very few trains and I was like, and you're in the center of Europe, so it's fantastic how connected you are. <laughs> But then I spent some time in Zurich and then I came back to, because <laughs> my boyfriend lives there. And then when I came back to Germany, I thought, oh my God, the trains are always delayed. That's when I felt <laughs> like I'm becoming a German. I can't complain about the trains being delayed. <laughs> uh, yeah. <laughs> Yeah, and just to transition here a little bit and to highlight your story, you've studied and worked across a variety of countries like you talked about. Eleven, you said, right? Yeah. Yeah, so Ireland, Luxembourg, Portugal, obviously, the Netherlands, the U.S. I mean, how do you see Germany differing from these countries when it comes to work culture and conditions? Like as a, of course, from a research perspective, if you'd like, but also from a personal perspective, because you've seen so many different scenarios. I think that from a personal perspective, so I would say something in common with like Germany, the Netherlands and Denmark, it's really that there is a great respect for your private life and for working schedules that, for example, you do not have in Portugal, you do not have in the US or in Costa Rica. I mean, it's just an absurd example, but in Portugal, you're seen as a really hard worker if you leave after your boss, irrespective of how much you have produced in that day, irrespective of how many coffee breaks you take. And, you know, here in the Nordics, people don't care how much time you spend in the office. It's really by like how much you produce. And you're almost seen as inefficient if you just spend your entire day in the office. You know, it's like you should have been done with work. Why are you still here? And I think that's, um, yeah, definitely something that I value a lot about the Nordics, where I include Germany, I would say. And I think Germany also has a big advantage that you have very fair working schedules and you have a very fair pay. So you you manage to have a very good quality of life, I think, compared with many other locations where I have been. I think Germany has a very good equilibrium. Germans complain a lot, sure, but <laughs> I think that coming from abroad, I think these things are really important. You manage to have a good quality of life. And yeah, you have very fair working schedules that contribute for this and very fair pay and this sort of like respect for your private life. <laughs> the language is a struggle, but you can go there if you invest more maybe than what I did. <laughs> but, <laughs> yes, <laughs> it's important definitely to learn. Teresa, thank you so much for joining us. This has been great. And um, I wish you all the best. And I look forward to seeing you be Dr. Teresa pretty soon here. <laughs> thank you for having me. It was a pleasure. <laughs> It's hard to predict exactly how the German labor market will develop in the future, but it's definitely important to stay informed about new developments and laws as there's a lot of changes happening currently. Our top three tips from this episode include, first, the law, for example, that Teresa mentioned is the new Skilled Immigration Act, which is supposed to make it easier for skilled workers to immigrate to Germany and to speed up the recognition process. You can learn more about that using the links in the show notes. Second, there is a need for international talent in Germany. But no matter what industry you're in, one of the most important factors for a long-term career in Germany is language skills. So it's definitely worth learning German. And third, larger companies in Germany are particularly successful at creating a work environment where international employees feel comfortable, integrated, and can thrive. However, it's important not to forget that Germany's economy is powered by its small and medium-sized enterprises, referred to as the German Mittelstand, which you also should not overlook in your search. To find a company that suits you, make sure you feel welcome, starting with the application process. You can also find the links to the Future of Work Lab, as well as to the Institute for Employment Research in our show notes. Do you have any questions related to working and careers in Germany? You can submit them to the Alumni Portal, and we may address them on a future episode of the show. Check the show notes for a link to the contact form. 
So Teresa, to, to wrap up our conversation, I have one last question for you. And that is, do you have a favorite German word related to future of work in Germany or just working in Germany in general? No, but I have a favorite word, which was the name of my job position at the Abbey, which took me a long time until I was able to pronounce it. And I probably still do it wrong, which is Wissenschaftliche Mitarbeiter. Wissenschaftliche <laughs> <laughs> Mitarbeiter. <laughs> like an extremely long word. <laughs> Inside Deutschland, Your Guide to Careers in Germany is a podcast brought to you by the Alumni Portal Deutschland. I am your host, Jessica Schuler. Sound design, music, and production by Anne Bergner from Der Apparat Multimedia GmbH. Editing and production by Jessica Schuler, as well as Amelie Berbot and Leonie Klusendorf from Der Apparat Multimedia GmbH.